Good morning, church. Please go ahead and make your way to your seats, and we'll begin our time this morning of worship together. What a blessing to be gathered together to worship our Lord. Amen. We're here to worship the one true and living God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God who is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God who revealed himself through prophets in the Old Testament and in these last days sent his son for us and for our salvation to die on the cross to save us from our sins, to make us new, and to give us eternal life. And so that's why we are here gathered together to worship him. We're here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life, who died a sacrificial atoning death on the cross, who raised from the dead three days later, who ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God and is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Every, every soul will have to give an account to Jesus for how they lived their life. And we know that none of us could stand and pass through that judgment if it were not for the grace of God that was purchased for us by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're here to worship him and to thank him and to seek him. And uh, as the men heard at the men's retreat in our first session, to set our hearts to seek the Lord. So let's do that this morning. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 48, verses 1 through 3. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Very excited and ready to worship the Lord. Thank him for all good things. He's worthy. We want to be thankful, just like Jeff said, to all the things he did for his salvation, for his love, for his grace, and his mercies that are from generation to generation, and we're this lead generation in this present time, and we thank him for all those good things. And uh, so it's just good to, to worship with you, and let's just place our attention and put our adoration, thanksgiving, and be humble before the Lord as we worship him and thank him, and, and uh, he's so worthy of all our praise and honor and the glory.
Wow. Seems to be thinner today than others. But it's good because 54 men, more than ever before from the church, were away on a retreat. And it was a glorious time of retreat. It really was. We made it back in here this morning so we could be with you before everybody gets back from the hill at noon or whatever. So it's good to see you all. And this morning, whether you've been here for the first time or you've been here since Redeem was founded, we want you to feel loved. Always loved here. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we here at Redeemed South Bay have a, a genuine love and concern for one another. And we have that same love and concern for those who come to us for the first time. We draw close to God here in song, in prayer, in teaching, in preaching the truth, the truth about having a right relationship with God and all of that comes to the Lord. By God's grace, we endeavor to teach the truth honestly and directly, verse by verse from God's word. The truth about God's grace, sin, the nature of man, all of the things you need to know to have a godly life. So we're blessed to have all of you here today, old or new. It's a blessing. And concerning the communion, if you are a born-again baptized believer, please join us in communion this morning. If you are not yet a believer, let the elements go by, and we will pray that you will soon be with us in this ordinance. The offering tray and the elements will be passed. And take the two little cups, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, the bread on the bottom, juice on the top, and hold on to it. And after it's all served, I'll come up and give a short address, and then we will take communion together. Right now, we're going to have the pastoral prayer, and I ask that you would join me in this prayer. O oh Lord, our God, you shower us this morning with springs of joy and blessings as we come before you. You comfort our souls and make us aware of your presence, cheering and refreshing our minds and hearts. And Lord, it's by your great mercy that you also show us our sins and imperfections so that we can fervently come before you in a heart-humbling way. And in your mercy, Lord, in your mercy, you grant us your heart-comforting way. Our eyes are filled with tears for our sins, but our hearts are filled with joy by your mercy. Father, you tell us that you are a jealous God, even that your name is jealous. It is rightly so. All power, glory, and dominion are yours. We know that you will not tolerate any form of rivalry that takes away from the time and attention that should be devoted to you. You've been very clear about the importance of seeking you first and putting nothing before you. Not men or gods, governments or idols. You are the highest and greatest being there is, infinitely holy and supremely glorious, and you are passionately committed to preserving your honor and supremacy. Lord, we know from your word that we should submit to earthly governments and governing authorities. You have instituted them. They, like all other things in creation, are in your hand. We pray that you would give us leaders at every level who know and revere you. We pray for our president, our governor, our legislators and mayors, and all that are in authority. Lord, use them for your glory. Father, we pray that you would give us favor with our city as we expand the church facilities. We pray for strong families who are raising their children to know and serve you. We pray for the Choi family and the work they're doing in Cambodia. We pray that our brothers return safe from the retreat. 
We pray that we would be encouraged and enlightened by Kevin's sermon this morning. We pray for our deacons and the wonderful work they do. Grant them strength and patience. We pray that we would love one another so that the world would see Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would have mercy on those among us who are afflicted. Please bless and comfort them that they would be filled with faith, trust, and hope in you. We lift up Tim Tyndall. He's suffering from cancer in an advanced form. Seeks after you in everything, even in this hard time. Bless him. Pray for Mark Akers, Lord, also having cancer treatments. Lord, be with him. Heal him. And bring him into, into good health, Lord. We pray for all those that even though we don't know by name who it is right now, that, that you always take care of your children. You're always there for us. You're always there when we're in need. And Lord, we pray that you, they would reach out to you in, in their needs this morning. Father God, we thank you for this time of gathering with the saints and in your presence. May this offering this morning be used wisely and to your glory. Amen. In chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, which we use often in communion, the Lord tells us to remember him when we take communion. And there is so much to remember about Christ, both in his earthly life and in his appearance in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, and in the prophets. In our own lives, we remember the time when he saved us and the many blessings that he's given us throughout our lives. In John 21, 25, John says of Jesus' earthly life, now there are so many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written, I would suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. To our great blessing, we are part of the story that Jesus has filled the world with since the time began. Those books aren't written on paper. Those books are written on the heart and in the heavens. In 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3, it says, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Let's remember as we take communion that the story of Christ's work in this world is still being written on our hearts and on the hearts of millions of others as we become pages in this glorious story that will be remembered throughout eternity. First Corinthians eleven twenty three says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please take the bread. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please take it. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of remembrance. May we never forget any of your glorious blessings to us. Your grace and your mercy sustain us. We long for the day that we will sit at your table face to face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, 
pass uh, your cups to the center. That would be good. Greek people, say hi to everybody, and you can take your kids to class now. Good morning, church. We we'll invite you to make your way to your seats, and we'll continue our time together with a few announcements. As many of you know, our men are in their last session of the men's retreat right now. So uh, if you could just be praying for them, the Lord would do a, a great work through uh, Pastor Harry Walls as he's preaching the word to them. And uh, also that they would just come back refreshed, rejuvenated, uh, strengthened in their souls to serve their families and their neighbors and their church. Uh, that's what we'd love for you to do. Uh, it's been a great time that we got to spend with those brothers up there this weekend, so we're thankful for that. By way of announcements, we want you to uh, uh, be informed about a couple of different events that we have coming up. Uh, first of all, the Mother's Day luncheon is Saturday, May 6th, and so we invite you, uh, all the mothers, to come out to that and just feel a shower of appreciation and love. Um, we appreciate mothers. We appreciate what you do and all that you, uh, all that you do to love your, your, your husbands, your children. Um, and so come, be honored. Uh, we need you, though, to RSVP to Penny Ross no later than today. Uh, there's child care available, but must be reserved in advance. And if you're not a mother but would like to help, please contact Paula Moorefield for that. Uh, so once again, if you're interested uh, on coming, which we hope that you will come, when do you need to RSVP by? Today. Good job. Nice. Well done. Uh, and Paula's here. Paula, if you just raise your hand, you can, you can RSVP to Paula. All right, y'all. Um, Next, next announcement we have for you is our Financial Peace University. Uh, this is a class that will take place over nine evenings uh, from May 2nd to July 27th, and it'll be 6.30 to 8, thir or to 8 p.m. Uh, on Tuesday evenings. Uh, and so if you are interested, would like more information for that class, you can contact Pastor Warren Chun for more information. Uh, but this class will help you learn how to budget, pay off debt, invest, uh, and more with Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. Uh, so many of you probably heard of Dave Ramsey before, have listened to him at various points. Uh, if you've never taken a financial class, this is a great opportunity um, for you to come and to, to learn a little bit. And, and, and even if you're like, I kind of already have these principles down, you can come and just be refreshed uh, in, in some of them and be encouraged. And you can also help others uh, uh, to to get more disciplined and, and grow in their wisdom in regards to uh, their finances. And so uh, take advantage of this class. It's going to be an awesome class um, beginning May 2nd. Also, we want to announce the, the Walk for Life that the Pregnancy Help Center in Torrance puts on is coming up on May 20th, and that's Saturday, May 20th. If you'd like to sign up for that, uh, Carly will be, I think, outside. She'll have a table, um, and you can, you can go and, and sign up for the, the Walk for Life. Um, if you want more information on that, you can uh, check out supportphctorrance.org uh, for more information from the Pregnancy Help Center on the Walk for Life. Uh, with that said, I um, want to remind you that our church has a uh, plurality of pastors and elders. We have multiple pastors and elders, and we rotate the preaching of God's word each morning. And so if you're with us and you're visiting for the first time, uh, this, the pastor that you hear from this morning um, will, will not be the pastor typically that you hear the next week and the week after. And so we have a rotation of, of those who are teaching and preaching. But this morning we get to hear from Pastor Kevin Bryan. Uh, but before we do that, let's stand and sing praise to God one more time as we ask him to prepare.
Get your Bibles and open to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 this morning. Hebrews 12, 1 through 11. I also bring greetings from the men of Redeemed South Bay <laughs> to their loving congregation, wives and sons and daughters and friends who are uh, back here today. Uh, what a blessed time. Uh, what a blessed time. And, I, and, and through uh, Pastor Harry Walls, I also bring greetings who he brought greetings to us from Dr. John MacArthur to Redeem South Bay to say how pleased he is to be with us uh, and for uh, Pastor John and others releasing him to come and spend time with us. It's uh, definitely a blessed, a blessed time. So uh, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 11, we're going to have a kind of a one-shot uh, sermon this morning as we is our custom. We do go verse by verse through the Bible, and um, so, uh, but because the men are away, uh, this, the, the place we are in Ephesians is on husbands love your wives. And so uh, I could be preaching to Jeff Alfasa, husband, love your wife, right? And maybe at Dave over here, but uh, Ray, of course. But since the men are away, we're going to, uh, we'll hold on to that sermon and we'll preach that sermon next week. Uh, I would appreciate uh, if you, uh, those of you who are here, if you are a husband, if you long to be a husband, if you're married to a husband, uh, read ahead. Look at that section, and in, in, uh, it's on the bottom of your notes there. Read ahead, pray through that, and be prepared to hear about uh, what it is to be a godly husband uh, next week. But today we're in Hebrews chapter 12. And so uh, let's begin here. Uh, just as a reminder, as we say here often, uh, this is the Word of God. This is the very Word of God. To believe this Word is to believe God Himself. To disobey this Word is to disobey God Himself. Verse 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. We thank you for this morning that you've set aside for us to gather to worship your holy name, to worship your Son, Jesus Christ, through the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. We ask even now, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, shine your light upon this passage for us today, that we may understand what there is here for us, that we may be encouraged by your word. Lord, help us to believe it. Help us to obey it. Help us to live it. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Well, the writer to the Hebrews, this epistle, this letter, is a profound and deep theological letter, full of, full of rich and powerful doctrine. And I would encourage you to go back and, and reread this epistle, maybe this week or sometime in the near future. As you work through chapter by chapter this letter, 
you see something over and over again. We see that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. We see that Jesus is the better lawgiver. He is a better priest. He has a better covenant. He's a better sacrifice. We have a better temple, a better kingdom, a better country. We now are a better people. We're better subjects. And we receive in Christ a better life. So the message is this. Don't give up. Don't give up. The central message of Hebrews is this. The central message of Hebrews is this. Don't fall away from Jesus. Don't fall away from Jesus. When trials come, when the clouds of life are dark, when temptations come, how, how do I keep my faith? How do I keep going when I'm tired and alone? I want to cry uncle. I want to tap out. How do I do this? Well, friend, brothers and sisters, the writer to the Hebrews has a message for them and a message to us. And we could really sum it up in this. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. We're going to see this unpacked, really, in, in four points this morning. Number one, run with endurance. Number two, look to Jesus. Number three, consider His suffering. And finally, rejoice in discipline. So let's get started. Number one, run with endurance. Look at 12.1 again. It starts with the word, therefore. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. This therefore is, reason, is there for a reason, right? We always say that. Why is that therefore, therefore? Right? It's there for us to look back. And we look back at the, at, at the, at the previous chapter, which is Hebrews 11, which is known really as the, as the hall of faith, the great hall of faith. And throughout this passage, turn back with me to chapter 11. We see at the beginning, it starts out describing what faith is. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. These people who have gone before us, the people of old, the people of the Old Testament, the saints that lived before us, they, they lived by faith. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And then the writer goes on and says, one person after another, Old Testament saints who live by faith, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, uh, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Sarah. Verse 13, he says, these all died in faith, having not received the things promised, having not received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged they were strangers and exiles in the earth. So, so, so we, we see, he continues on in verse 17, by faith Abraham again, and by faith Jacob, by faith Moses. If we look on uh, page, uh, or not page, uh, verse, uh, verse 29, uh, by faith the people crossed the Red Sea. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Verse 32, what more shall I say? It's like he's run out of things to say, but he, he's got to remind us. By faith, uh, he says, for time would, not, would fail me to tell you of, of Gideon and, and Barak and Samson and Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets, all these who, who conquered kingdoms, who enforced justice, who obtained promises, who stopped the mouth of lions, who quenched the power of fire, who escaped the edge of the sword, who were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. And he goes on and on. That's why the therefore is therefore. <laughs> to say, look, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings, sings, that, that clings so closely. We look, we don't, we don't know necessarily that these saints are watching us here. He's really, he's really telling us about them to inspire us to remember them that they have gone before us, they have lived by faith, and so you can too. In a way, we can metaphorically look at the stands. Those who have crossed the finish line then, then congregate in the stands and, and, in, and in some, like I said, metaphorical way are watching us as well. 
I can remember when I was, uh, I think I was in second grade in Pottsboro, Texas, there was going to be a track meet. And uh, we never had track meets for second graders, right? But there was going to be like once a year, we're going to have a big track meet. And so I was going to run the 50-yard dash, you know, and I was so excited. Other kids were doing shot put. Like, you may have a second grader shot put, <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> shot put, throw the disc, well, all these things. But I was going to do this, the 50-yard dash. So my parents bought me some little shorts, you know, for that and a special T-shirt. And I, I got there. I had never even practiced running the 50-yard dash. We just all showed up, right? And they had, they had a little gun, and they had the whole thing at the, at the, uh, the track meet there at this, uh, the, the, the track at the local school, at the high school. And, the, so of course, the crowd is all filled with parents in the stands. And I'm standing there ready to go, and my dad has talked to me about how to take off and how to run. And, and so, sure enough, pow, the gun goes off, and I kind of start running. But then what do I do? I look to the stands. Where's, you know, I can't find, I'm trying to see, can they see me? Where's my mom? Where's my dad? And I'm looking, I'm looking, the kids are all running, you know, and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and all of a sudden I see my mom. I can't, and she yells, run, Kevin, run, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, I took off. I'd like to say that I won that, but, uh, <laughs> but look, brothers and sisters, the writer of the Hebrews is telling us, Look at these who have gone before you. All these have gone before you. By faith, they have fought the good fight. They have finished the race. Look to them. They're witnesses. They're witnesses of Christ. They have stood for him, and they know the reality of the race. And so we can remember then to do this as well. The writer tells us to do this when we run. He says, lay aside every weight. Lay aside every weight. Can you imagine running a marathon with a huge backpack on? I'm in a backpack, and, and then what else you need? Well, I need a backpack, and I also need my water bottle, and, a, and you, actually, I need a ghetto blaster. I'm going to take that with me because that will inspire me. on the, you, know, I'm gonna, you, know, what, you know, what are all the things? And, and, and you're trying to run a marathon with all this weight, all this weight. No, he says, he says lay it aside. The question for us is, is, is when we run this wet race, Brothers and sisters, what is, what's weighing you down? What is weighing you down? What is encumbering you? What is, what is keeping you from running with agility and running with speed? Lay that aside. You know what it is. You lay that aside. Put it down and run the race. Run the race. He also says this then, and lay aside every sin Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. It's like like, uh, tripping you up, right? I was at at school just uh, a a couple weeks ago, and uh, I know Debbie knows this, so I got a friend here today. So so the, the kids come out, and we always tell them at school, the one thing that you do at elementary school is say, don't run. Don't run. You can run on the playground, but when, they, when, the, when you let the little kindergartners go and they start heading, and so this little dude is running, and he's got his backpack, and the, the, the strap is hanging down, and I can see him, and I, I saw it getting ready to happen, right, because it's just down there flapping along, flapping along, all of a sudden it, 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 it gains purchase upon his foot, right? And there, there he goes, you know, skids into home plate almost. He was okay. But isn't that a way it is with our, with our sin, Right? Our sin, it, it is it's clinging so closely. And so he said, lay that aside. Lay aside the sin which clings so closely and run with endurance. Whatever sin it is that you're holding on to, whatever sin that's, that's clinging so closely, that's tripping you up, that's keeping you from running with endurance, lay it aside. Repent and turn your heart to Christ. Turn your heart to Christ. And then he says this, run with endurance. Run with endurance the, the, the race that is set before us. Um, in California, you may not realize this, some of you may, but there are 15 mountains in California that are over 14,000 feet. So 15 mountains that are over 14,000 feet, they call them the 14ers. And uh, there are those who have set records going up and running and, and climbing these mountains. In 2002, a gentleman named Jack McBroom climbed all 15 of these mountains in four days, 11 hours, and 19 minutes. Okay, So he's running up to the top of the mountain, 
coming down, going to the next one, going to the next one. He actually, actually had to hop in his car and drive to one of these other ones. But all 15, he broke the record in 2002. You can see his you know, face in uh, Sports Illustrated and other places where they keep these kind of records. And he talked about how he had to train. He had to train. He had to have good lungs. I mean, his legs, you know, super strong. Uh, he had to train. He had to keep going. He had to do what? He had to endure. He had to endure. He had to persevere. He had to not give up. So the question is, when we, when we endure as well, when we endure through this race, where is our focus as you're running the race? Where is your focus? This endurance athlete had to, had to keep his mind on that 15th mountain, the last one. I can do it. I've got to keep going. But where's our focus as we're running this race as Christians? Is it, is, it, is it the world? Is it the track? Are we looking down? Or is it our feet? Are we looking to the left or looking to the right? No. No. This brings us to point two. We, we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus. Look at verse two. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder of and perfecter of our faith, looking to Jesus. So he's saying what? Fix your eyes upon Jesus. Fix your eyes upon Jesus as you're running this race. We sing the song often, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Many of us sometimes, I think, are like, or like uh, my little dog with a squirrel or the raccoon, right? Whenever that something runs out there, we're looking, look at that, look at this, look at that, squirrel, squirrel, right? No, we've got to fix our eyes on Jesus to steadfastly gaze upon our Savior and keep Him in our focus as we're running this race. Why? Because He is the founder. He is the source. He is the pioneer. He is the exemplar. He is the one who, who created the whole thing. He's the founder of this race. He has set it for us. And also, Hebrews tells us, he is the perfecter. Not only the founder, but the one who will complete and has completed and perfected our faith. Why do we look to Jesus? Because he has crossed the finish line. He has crossed the finish line. How? It says it right here, doesn't it? Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Brother, sister, you can run the race because Jesus has completed his. You can run the race because Jesus has completed his. And really, that's the only way you can run this race. The only way we can endure is because he has endured. Jesus was able to endure the cross because he saw through the shame to the joy. He saw through the shame to the joy. What does it say? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus was able to endure because he saw through the shame to the joy. He suffered. Uh, the suffering would, would, would bring joy. He saw that. He saw that the suffering would, would reveal joy. The suffering would, would not stop his joy. And without the suffering, there would be no joy. Without Christ's suffering, there would be no joy for himself or for us as well. Jesus came into the world. Why? To save sinners. And this was... The only way. This was the only way. Look with me at uh, 1, Peter, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9 says this. When it refers to our own trials, our own grief, the endurance we must, uh, the things we must go through and endure. It says this. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found in result to pr in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. 
Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Jesus came into the world to, to save us. And, and so, yes, we may have trials and we may be facing trials right now. But he says here, we have to tra- face trials maybe for a little while. Maybe for a little while, but, but what happens? We end up receiving our great reward because of what Christ has done for us. So it's worth suffering. It's worth enduring because we will be in glory with Jesus Christ. Amen? Number three, consider his suffering. Consider his suffering. Look back at uh, Hebrews 12, 3 to 4. It says this, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Consider his suffering. One of the best places to, to do this would be Isaiah fifty two thirteen. Listen, you can flip over there if you'd like to, but listen to me as I read Isaiah 50, 52 through 13, where Isaiah demonstrates and uh, expounds upon the great suffering that our Savior did for us upon the cross. He says this, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told, they shall see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the, Lord, the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. And he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the sh- like like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered among the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. We have to read that, brothers and sisters, and and, and think deeply about the suffering of Jesus Christ, what he did for us. Our sin is costly. Our sin is costly. And we sing about it over and over today in our in our songs. It it costs so much, but but His grace is so much greater. But we can't think of grace as just something that says, ah, oh, no big deal. It really bothers me today when you tell someone, uh, I'm sorry, right, or whatever, they say, no problem, right? Or, you, or if you say thank you too, right, thank you, no problem, or no worries. I want to tell them, I'm not worried. <laughs> I'm not worried about anything. I'm thanking you. I'm not worried. Or, or thank you, no problem, Right? When we say, you know, I'm sorry, it's okay. No, it's not okay, right? Our sin 
cost our Savior his very life. He bore the sin of many. He bore the sin of redeemed South Bay upon himself. Every idle thought, every, every lustful thought, every, every gossipy word, every backbiting thing, every bitterness be- between a husband and a wife or a son and a daughter or a father and a son, or a, you know what I'm saying. Every one of those was laid upon our Savior at the cross. And there he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. So we must, when we're running this, this race of faith, the, the writer of the Hebrews says you've got to consider his suffering. Consider it. And because of that, know this is why I'm running. I'm running because he's made me able to run this race. He's paid the price for my sin and paid it in full, as we say here often, past, present, and future. And then we have to remember this. If he ran the race for me, if he ran the race for me, can't I run the race for him? It's just too hard. It's just too boring to read the Bible. Come and hear Kevin yell at me on Sundays. Come on, please. You know, Pastor Kenny, he uses all those big words, right? It's too much, right? No, you know, it's too hard to be a good, a good employee. It's too hard to be a good boss. It's too hard to, to love my husband, to love my wife. It's just too much. You don't, if, you just, if, you, if you understand what I was going through, Kevin, you would know. I don't understand. But guess what? Someone does. That's Jesus Christ who suffered for you. And because he suffered for you, can't you suffer for him? If he ran the race for me, can I run, the, can I run it for him? If he suffered for me, can't I suffer for him? Don't grow weary and lose heart. Don't grow weary, he says. Don't grow weary and lose heart because you are not suffering alone. We've said it many times. Jesus Christ suffered, has suffered immeasurably more than any of us will ever suffer. He did it for us and for his glory. Verse 4 says this. Another just little reminder that the Hebrew writer has for us. He says, and, and just remember, it's almost like a parenthetical comment almost. And besides considering his suffering, just remember this. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. What is he saying? He's saying you're still alive. <laughs> you may have resisted. You may have had some suffering, but no one's taken your head yet. Now, I want to add this. You've not resisted to the point of shedding your blood yet. You might. You might. And that's what Christianity calls us to. Right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, whenever God bids a man, he bids him come die. And there we be, 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 be the sense of dying to ourselves, yes. But also, he may ask us to actually die, die. <laughs> to die, really. To die for Christ. We live for him. Can we die for him as well? But here's a more profound question that I, that I have. Most of us, I think, would say, yes, I will die for Christ. I would not forsake my profession of faith. I'll, I will die for him. But here's my question for you, American Christian, in this day and age. Are you willing to be embarrassed for him? Oh, I will die for him. I would die for Christ. Yes, I would. Are you willing to be embarrassed? Are you willing to be called names? Are you willing to be inconvenienced? Before the firing squad, yes, I'm willing to go there. But how about just before my friends, before my coworkers? We're, we're in a time in our land now where many of us will be called to be embarrassed for Christ, to take a stand for Christ and be able to say, no, I, I can't do that because I love Jesus, because I love Jesus and he suffered for me. And so, so I'm not willing to go there. I'm going to stand for Christ. And that's what it means to keep running this race. And, you know, some of the races, I think the Christian race is more like hurdles, right? You know, it's cross country. It's not just this one flat path that goes all the way straight, right? No, there's, there's hurdles in this race. And you're running along, oh, my goodness, you know, there's things jumping at it. It's more like these uh, crazy things that you did. I don't know what it's called, those crazy run things. Yeah, mud and, you know, dogs and snakes and things like that. You know, I don't know what they do. Dragons. 
all sorts of things, right? We don't know what, what God is going to place in our path, but we have to be ready to, 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 to go through these obstacles, right? Point four, rejoice in discipline. Rejoice in discipline. Then the Hebrew writer takes a little bit of a turn in a way, and he, he reminds these, these readers, and he reminds us as well, that we should rejoice in discipline. He says this, look at verses 5 and 11 again. He says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? He's reminding them that, yes, you're going through some suffering, you're going through trials, you're going through challenges. Look to Jesus, repent of your sin, throw off these weights that are, that are, that are, that are slowing you down, and also do this. Remember discipline. Have you considered this? Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Maybe the, way, the reason you're going through some suffering, some trials, is because God loves you so much that He's actually disciplining you. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises every son He, he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate sons. Besides this, we've all had earthly fathers who disciplined us and respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for his good that we may share in his holiness." This discipline is not really meant to be seen as punitive. It's not God necessarily punishing us, but disciplining us. It, it, it is, it's, it's corrective. It's educative. It's training. It's equipping. It's preparing. This discipline is not God's punishment, but God's fatherly discipline. You are a true child of God if He disciplines you. You're a true child of God if God is disciplining you. And what does he say? He says, because if he's not disciplining you, then you are a, and I, when I preached it at Loft, I said, you know, the bad word, bastard, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're an illegitimate child. How many times have, in my career as an educator, have I sometimes seen a kid just who's out there doing their own thing, doing whatever they want? I don't look at that child who's doing whatever he wants and acting however he wants and going wherever he wants, and, and, and I don't look at that child and say, oh, wow, man, how that, that child is so loved. They are so loved. I can tell because those parents let him do whatever he wants. No, I think just the opposite. That child, those parents do not love that child because they don't love him enough to tell him, no, let me discipline you, let me help you, let me train you. In righteousness, let me teach you. Let me pull you aside, young men, and teach you how to act. You see, discipline, discipline also equals freedom. The more disciplined you are, the more free you will be. And let me give you an illustration of that. The world's view of freedom right now is to do whatever you want. I can just do whatever I want. And so in the world's view of freedom... I am free, I am free to, to play the piano. And I, I am. I could walk right over there and make a whole bunch of noise. I don't know anything about pan, playing a piano except that's a big black thing with a lot of keys on it, right? There's some black ones and some white ones. And Dennis does his thing, right? I could go over there and I'm not, you know, but, but you're free. You are free to play it. Yes, you are. You are totally free. If I go over there and play, I am free to only do one thing, make noise. The person who is free to play the piano is that man or woman who has been disciplined to practice and practice and practice and practice. And then with that discipline and training comes freedom. And we're all amazed when some person can just come and sit down and go, you know, and you're like, my goodness, that is amazing. Discipline, God's discipline gives us freedom to live the way God has has really taught us to live. And yes, He does correct us. He does train us. I will never forget in, 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 my, in my life growing up, 
I grew up in a, in a godly home with a mother and father who did love us and who believed the Word of God. My brother, who's younger than me, who's Pastor Garen, uh, is six years my younger. And uh, he went through a little stage when he was about in uh, probably a sophomore year in high school. He started getting a little full of himself. And um, if he told you this story, he would tell you. This was a turning point in his life. So I'm going to tell you that up front before I tell you what happened. <laughs> he was sitting on the floor watching TV in our little house in Texas. My dad was, has always been a working man. And at that time, he had a body shop. So my dad would often come home, whatever color of the car he was painting that day. He worked hard all day, right? Physical labor. And he walked in, he would walk in, and he would be pink or not pink, use <laughs> blue or whatever color, right? He would walk in, and so, and so this day, my brother's sitting in front of the TV. My mom is talking to him about getting this paper done for English. And she's saying, you need to turn off the TV because you got to write this paper. And, and as the door opens, my, my brother doesn't see him. My dad hears this transaction. And, he, and she says, if you don't, Mrs. So-and-so called, and she says, if you don't turn this paper in, you're going to flunk the class. As my dad steps in, he hears, my bro- he hears that and hears my brother say, so what? My dad was not very happy with that. He grabbed the back of my brother's shirt and chunked him out of the house. He landed on the ground and stood up. And my dad looked. We were putting new shingles on the top of this little house, cedar shake shingles. And so there's a little board here, right? A thin board. My dad looks over there and grabs that board, grabs my my brother, and whack, you know, on his butt. My brother hit the ground and yelled, oh, God, oh, God. And my dad said, you better pray. (laughs) And he picked him up, whack, whacked him again. He hit the ground. He gave him about three good whacks. And my brother will tell you to this day, that was the turning point in his life. That was the turning point in his life. And he thanks our father that he loved him enough to not allow him to speak to our mother that way, to choose a path of rebellion and sloth, but instead to be trained by discipline. The goal of my father is not, I want to hurt my son. The goal is, I want to help my son. And Scripture is clear about how we help children. And And the writer says this, We've all been disciplined by our sons, and we respected them for it, Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? Earthly fathers give life to human children. Our Heavenly Father has given life to us, spiritual children. He has caused us to be born again. We are children of God. And so in the same way that we respect our fathers for disciplining us, shouldn't we respect our Heavenly Father for disciplining us as well when these trials and these challenges come? He is disciplining us. He is helping us to endure in our Christian walk. Eric Little said this, the great um, Olympic runner from Scotland, I believe. He said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. When I run, I feel God's pleasure. Eric Little knew, it's like, this is what God has created me to do. I am created to run and to run with abandon, to run with discipline, to run fast. And when I do that, I know that's what God has created me for. I feel God's pleasure. Back to my story earlier about Jack McBroom, who was an endurance runner, who broke a record for running all 15,000, 14,000 foot mountains. The end of the story is, is... is sad because that man, Jack McBroom, was my, my youth pastor. And Jack McBroom was a diligent runner, an endurance athlete who could endure incredibly physically. But my youth pastor did not endure spiritually. Later in life, he, he abandoned the faith. He gave up. He changed his mind about Jesus about the virgin birth, about the resurrection, everything. He threw it all away. He did not endure. He could endure physically, but he could not endure spiritually. 
So my encourage to you today, and the encourage from Hebrews is this, don't give up. Don't give up. Endure. Run. And my prayer for you, brothers and sisters, you will be like Eric Little. We will run with joy, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and that every one of you will burst through that finish line (laughs) with arms raised and, and fall into the loving arms of Jesus Christ, who has run that race before us. May you run today. And if you need help running, talk to one of the elders or one of your brothers and sisters that's sitting around you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Well, Lord, we know you are a, you are a great God. And we know that uh, each of us, if we're human, and if in the sound of my voice, we have suffered. We have had trials. We have had challenges. We have had heartache. Lord, but you know every single thing that we've faced. And we're encouraged today to hear from your word that we can endure and we can run this race of faith because of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us. Help us to take our eyes off ourselves. Help us to take our eyes off the track, but to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who has run this race for us and before us. And because he has done this, he we can do it as well. Lord, help us. Help us in this. We love you today, and we commit ourselves to you again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing one more song, and uh, there'll be uh, elders here forward to pray with you if you need any prayer. Let's sing.
Another encouragement for you is this. There is a finish line. There is a finish line. This race doesn't go on forever. There is a finish line. Some of us are closer to the finish line than others. Some of our members, our dear Reuben, has passed the finish line, crossed it with arms held high. And so he can say, and we can say as well, yet not I, but Christ in me. I pray, dear brothers and sisters, that you will run with abandon. You will run with joy, with your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. May you do that this week and all the weeks to come until we bust through that tape. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your church. I thank you for these dear saints. Lord, I thank you for the men up on the mountain. Lord, would you continue to hold them safe, bring them back to us all. Lord, may they continue to be shaped uh, by the sermons they've heard into the, into the, to the man, the man that, that, that you've called them to be. Lord, help them. Lord, help us as well to run this race, the race that is set before us. Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We love you, Lord. We thank you for running this race for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you outside for some fellowship and some food.